Well, good morning, church. Come on, let's get up on your feet. Put your hands together like this. Come on, we're going to invite the Spirit into this place as we sing together. Come on, lift your voice. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weird soul. This bag of bones, yeah. And I try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond, yeah. And just when I It's so good to gather together and lift our voice in worship and sing out to our Father in heaven. And I love that that's why we gather in this place. We gather to let our faith rise, to let our belief be renewed and refreshed in, in the goodness of our Father that we uh, get to worship in this place. And so I want to challenge us today, you know, to disconnect our faith from our feelings, to unlink our faith from our feelings. Because too many times, if I'm not feeling it, my faith is low. And maybe I'm in a good mood and then I'm like, man, I got all the faith in the world. But today in this place, I just wanna challenge us 
to believe in the goodness of God, to believe in the faithfulness of God, whatever we're going through. So let's sing that out. Let's worship our God for who he is. Let's let our faith rise. Come on. Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness. You have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but sing. Come on, tell them.
his promises. Have you experienced that in your life before? Our God, he keeps his promises to you. He makes ways in the darkness. He promises to give you strength when you're feeling weary. He promises to give you rest when you feel like you can't go on. Our God, he promises us. He promises us eternal life. He promises us freedom from sin. Go ahead and grab your communion elements. Our risen Savior Jesus, once and for all, a finished and complete work. It was through his death and resurrection on the cross that we have eternal life with the Father. So let's take the bread. Let's remember the body of Jesus that was punished for you and for me. With, with the juice, let's, let's just remember the, the blood of Jesus that was poured out for us. Let's take a drink together.
Would you pray with me? Father, right now, God, I know there's people that are just clinging to your promises. It's all they've got. And yet we're reminded every single time when we open your word, when we come and we worship together, when we sing out your praises, that your promises are true and that we can cling to them because we know you are a good father who makes a way, who keeps his promises. Jesus, I'm so grateful. We're so grateful right now that that it's through you that we have freedom from sin, that we have eternal life that's promised to each of us. Jesus, thank you for taking our place on the cross. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You can take a seat. Thanks for worshiping with us today. As part of our vision, God has called us to amplify Jesus both online and globally. Because of your continued generosity and weekly giving, we are so blessed to continue to support 26 missionaries all around the globe. Recently, we had a small team visit our missionaries in East Watini and in Kenya. East Watini is a landlocked country inside of South Africa where 63% of the population live under the poverty level. 27% of the population has HIV and the life expectancy is amongst the lowest in the world. Through your support, we have been able to be part of the care point that provides education, food, and a church on location for the families in that region. Our team was able to connect with some CLA and other precious kiddos like her that are being cared for and fed because of your faithful giving. Our team was also able to visit John Keshe serving in the Maasai area of Kenya. John is a highly respected leader amongst the Maasai people and has several life-sustaining projects that we've been able to help him with, including the milk project to raise revenue for the women and children and a water well and filtration system that Connection Point installed a few years back. Our Kenya partners are in desperate need of our prayer and our continued support. It has not rained in 26 months in the area that John Keshe is serving in. Teddy Hobner, our missions pastor, shared with me that after his recent visit earlier this month, that it's absolutely heartbreaking to see the conditions. The milk project has officially been put on hold as the cows are no longer able to produce milk due to lack of hydration. In the middle of what could feel completely hopeless, there is a group of people weekly worshiping the Lord as a church body that gathers under a tree. What a beautiful picture and humble reminder that when we have nothing else to cling to, we can cling to and worship our Savior regardless of our circumstances. I am inspired by the work of our missionaries in both Eswatini and Kenya. I would ask you to join me in praying specifically for rain in Kenya and that the funds would come for this church that's meeting under a tree to build a multi-purpose building that could serve both as a church and a school. Thank you, Connection Point. God is using your prayers and your generosity to change lives all around the world. Now let's prepare our hearts for the word of God from Pastor John. Well, hey, way to go, church. Uh, In the midst of that drought over there in Kenya, that well exists for that tribe because of you. You guys funded that well. Uh, You guys funded those cows. And let's be praying that God will provide rain there. And uh, I don't know about you, I, the first time I saw that video of those people worshiping God and jumping and dancing, uh, people who have nothing compared to us materially, uh, and yet they're just rejoicing, um, it, it moved me to tears the first time I saw that. And I'm just so grateful to be part of a movement where as we combine our resources of our time, our energy, everything else, God is able to multiply out. With, uh, with the body of Christ, it's a lot more than one plus one equals two. It's like one plus one equals 11. And then you do one plus one plus one times however many thousands we've got, and it's just amazing to see God multiply. Uh, over in Avon, we're so glad you're with us today. Those of you online, we're so glad that you're with us today. I hope you know today that God loves you, and I really mean that. I hope you understand that 
there's a, li a living being who created you, who crafted you. And if this is your first time in church, or if maybe you've been coming for a long time, but you're just feeling far from God, you need to know today that he loves you, no matter what you're going through. That's very much what we're learning in this series. And today, we're going to talk about the times in life when you're going through pain, when you're going through suffering. Is it possible in the midst of that to smile? How do you smile through the pain in life? Last weekend, I ended the message with the story of my wife giving birth to our son, Jack, and without any epidural or pain medication, the severe agony, the tears of agony in a moment turned to tears of joy uh, when the birthing nurse and the doctor set that, uh, our son, on my wife's chest. And those same tears went from agony to delight. It was this mix of emotions, and really we're talking about that today. We'd like to think that the great highs of life, the wonderful things in life happen without pain, but real life experience, even if you're here and you don't yet know where you are with God, you just look at real life, it kind of declares that most good joy is on the other side of some kind of pain. Uh, we see this with childbirth. We also saw this at the Super Bowl. And I know some of you might be thinking about the halftime show, but that's not what I'm talking about, okay? I'm talking about the actual athletes and how much pain they push through, how much pain any successful person pushes through. Uh, I came across these two interviews. It was a historic Super Bowl. Most of you saw it. First one ever where both quarterbacks were African-American, really cool. Uh, also, a Super Bowl where both quarterbacks are devoted followers of Jesus, not just like casual Christians, but guys who talk openly about their faith. Listen to Patrick Mahomes before the game, talking about his relationship with God through Jesus and how he wanted to glorify God on the Super Bowl field. Go ahead and take a look. I mean, my Christian faith plays a role in everything that I do. I mean, I always ask God to, to lead me in the right direction and let me be who I am uh, for his name. So, it has a role in everything that I do, and obviously it will be on the huge stage in the Super Bowl that he's given me, and I want to make sure I'm glorifying him while I do it. Pretty cool, right? Pretty cool. Uh, it's always surprising slash not surprising when you find someone who's at the top of their field, and then you learn that they're a believer in Jesus, and they practice the principles of God's word. You'll find it all over the place. In fact, here's how Philadelphia Eagles quarterback Jalen Hurts after the game, and if, if you saw the game, it was a really close game. It was a really good game. It came down to one call that a lot of Philadelphia Eagles, you know, will never get over, uh, maybe understandably. And, but here's the thing. After all that, could you imagine being the quarterback? I mean, this guy has worked his whole life to get to this moment. What does he say after a defeat that just doesn't make any sense? Go ahead and take a look. My favorite scripture, John 13, 7, you may not know now, but later you understand, um, just, just reminds me to keep, um, continue to be patient, continue to, to remain diligent, steadfast, keep going, keep your eyes on me and keep God at the center, regardless of what the circumstance is. So I don't know if you caught that, but Jalen quoted this verse from John 13, verse 7, where Jesus is talking to the disciples and they don't understand they don't understand why their best friend and savior and Messiah has to go to the cross. They can't comprehend it. And in that moment, Jesus says to them, you do not realize right now, in this moment, you don't realize what I'm doing. You don't see right now how this is going to be for your good and for the good of others. Uh, right now, you can't comprehend that a day will come in your life and you'll look back on this difficulty that you don't understand and you'll say, oh God, that's what you were doing. And so Jesus says, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. I wonder in your life right now, what pain or loss do you not understand? Is it the loss of a loved one? Maybe it's the pain or the loss of family conflict. You're doing everything you can to reconcile with someone you love and they, they just won't. They're unreasonable. Maybe it's sickness. Maybe it's depression. Maybe for you, it's just trying to find your place in the world. You, you, you have a sense of you don't have roots. You don't know where you belong, and you keep trying, and, and you just don't understand. For my wife, Melanie, and me this week, this pain of just what we don't understand right now 
is the home going of our brother Brian Green. God called Brian home this last week. Just amazing brother in our church family. He was only 53 years old. It was around November that he and his precious wife Gwen learned that he had a form of cancer. Uh, And then just within a matter of months here, God called him home. And as a pastor, just like as a parent, I'm not supposed to have favorites. Uh, But Brian's just one of those that you just, um, he just is such an encourager. He loves on people so much. And I say is because of his faith in Jesus, he's alive today. He's just not with us. He's in the presence of God. There, there's a, a, a passage where after Jesus rose from the dead on that Easter morning, an angel says, he is not here for he is risen. And for all who've trusted in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, you have a 100% confidence that when your body dies, uh, you will be risen in the presence of God through Jesus' work on the cross. You don't have to pay money or do good deeds You just have to humble yourself to receive the free gift of salvation. And we know with 100% confidence that Brian did that. And we saw the change in his life as he became part of our mini marathon group here at Connection Point. Kind of became their mascot. Just loving on people, encouraging people. And um, sometimes in life, because this world's broken by sin, some of the best people get called home early. And I don't understand why that is. Uh, Can you relate to that feeling? Maybe for you it's the loss of a loved one. Maybe it's something else. Can you relate to just wondering, I I don't know how anything good could come out of this. That's the question we're going to wrestle with. How can you bring good from the worst situations in your life? How could you see God bring good from the worst situations in your life? If God answers this question for you in a way that right now, in in the middle of whatever you're going through, you could grab onto it, Uh, would you want to know what he says? Well, as we do here every weekend, we open the word of God and we have discovered that in the Bible, God answers these kind of questions, the very emotional questions as well as the very intellectual questions. And normally, I take you straight to the scripture, and then we kind of draw the answer out. But today, I'm going to jump to the answer and then show it to you from scripture. Here is the answer to this question. How can you bring good from the worst situations in your life? And it's this. uh, You've got to, when you're going through the difficulty, keep believing God's promises. Keep believing that he has a plan, even if it doesn't make sense. And keep trusting that even when your pain sensors physically or emotionally are screaming that there can't possibly be a plan, are screaming that you shouldn't trust God because of your pain. Now, I realize that just looking at this answer head on, it's a lot like if you're trying to be a fast race car driver and you were to go to, you know, Al Unser Jr. or someone and say, how do I drive faster? And they said, well, just drive faster. Right? Like, just trust his promises. Right? It it, it seems really hollow. It seems really empty. It seems kind of undoable. And so what I want to show you today is how to do this. And and I'm not here to unpack every promise of God, but I want to give you a really quick flyover of just four sample promises, because if you don't understand the kind of promises God gives you, this won't make sense. So uh, if you're someone who takes pictures with your phone of the slides, you might want to get ready for that. If you're a note taker, get ready to write real fast because we're just going to fly over four of these sample promises and then we're going to look at a true story of someone who did this to see how you can do this. Here's a promise. When you lose a loved one, you have the promise that you will be reunited with them. 1 Thessalonians 4 says, after that, after when Jesus returns, we who are still alive... And who are left, we will be caught up together with them. That is all the believers in Jesus who died before us in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be, we being us and Brian Green and every believer who's gone to heaven before us, we will be together with the Lord forever. This is just one of hundreds of promises. Here's a promise for uh, when you're dealing with shame, when you're dealing with sin, when you feel like you're not good enough the promise that you will be made perfect. Philippians 1 verse 6, God says this, you, follower of Jesus, can be confident 
not in your own strength, but confident that the God, the creator, who began a good work in you, the moment you believed in Jesus, he started a work in you, and God doesn't leave projects half finished. He will complete you. He will mature you. And so your progression spiritually, while you need to surrender, doesn't ultimately depend on you. It depends on him. That's a key promise. Here's a promise for when all you have in your life is pain with no hope. You claim the promise of Romans 8, that God will bring good from your pain. Romans 8, verse 28, this is one that's worth memorizing, all all of these are, is we know that God causes everything, even the bad things that other people do and that Satan has done, he causes it all to work together for good in the end. The good of who? Well, you're good if you've placed your faith in Jesus for the good of those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. Here's a promise for when sickness or suffering define your very existence, the promise that you will be healed from the book of Revelation, which tells you your future state, this will be a moment that you will experience in your future, that Jesus will wipe every tear from your eye. There will be a time that you cry the last tear. You'll look back on planet earth. You'll look back on all the suffering. You'll weep that you've finally been fully delivered. He'll wipe that final tear from your eye and there will be no more death. There will be no more grieving and mourning. There will be no more crying. There will be no more pain for the old order of things. That is all of this life as we know it, which is more broken than we understand, will be replaced with a new way of life. Uh, This visual kind of demonstrates, I just showed you four of these promises. There's a universe, galaxy of these promises that you can claim. And that's part of how you grow in Christ is you get to know his promises. And whenever you're going through difficulty, you search the scriptures and you ask other believers in your small group or come ask a pastor, ask one of us after a service, I need a promise of God for what I'm going through. And you learn to hold on to these. I want to take you now, uh, let's review. How do you see God work good from your pain? You keep believing his promises. I just showed you four out of 400, out of many more. And you keep trusting God has a plan. And I'm going to keep believing in him even as I go through my pain. So now I want to take you into the true story. Uh, I want to show you, you know, what does this look like in real life? What does this look like? And we find what it looks like in the true story of Joseph, which is recorded in your Bible in the book of Genesis, first book of the Bible. Joseph was one of the younger brothers out of like 12 guys. Imagine having that many brothers. And uh, he was hated by his other brothers, partly because God had given Joseph a promise for his future. And Joseph really claimed that promise. And starting in verse 18, his brothers, they're out in the field. They see Joseph in the distance. And as he's walking toward them, they're gossiping about him. Uh, We live in the Midwest, so you know what that's like, right? People gossip here all the time. Joseph's brothers were the same way. They're gossiping about him as he's walking toward them. And they've been doing this for so long, and the hatred in their heart has been growing, that they decide, being out in the middle of nowhere, that they're going to kill him when he gets there. Here comes that dreamer, verse 19, they said to each other. That dreamer, God had given Joseph a dream, a promise. Joseph didn't have the Bible like we do, so God spoke to Joseph in a dream. And Joseph held on to that promise, and these guys hated him for believing this promise of God. Come now, let's kill him. Let's throw him into one of these cisterns out here in the desert, then we'll see what comes of his dreams. So when Joseph came to his brothers, hey guys, how you doing? They strip him of his robe. And then look at this, verse 24. They took him and they threw him into the cistern. This is a hand dug, very deep well. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Joseph, if you can put yourself in his position, he's now been thrown into this deep pit. He's struggling at the bottom. The walls are too steep to climb up. And he can kind of hear the murmur of his brothers talking and the emotions as they're all exchanging. But he can't understand everything they're seeing. And as Joseph is saying, as he's struggling down there, his brothers see dust rising on the horizon. It was a roving band of slave traders making their way to North Africa, purchasing slaves on their way. One of the brothers says, hey, why leave Joseph here to die We're going to feel bad about that. 
let's just sell him as a slave and we'll actually make a little money off of the deal. So sell him they did. Joseph's life in a moment goes from secure in a pretty big family where you know, he knew the land, he had an inheritance, he was favored by his dad, to in a moment, chains digging into his flesh as he limps along for 30 days, mile after mile on foot, at a blistering pace with slavers whipping him whenever he doesn't keep up, prodding him, shoving him, shouting. Joseph finds himself surrounded by other slaves, many from other ethnicities and who speak other nation, uh, other languages, some frighteningly strong, some frighteningly wounded from these beatings by these slave traffickers. Others are coughing up blood, wheezing, dragging along behind this slave cart as their bodies give out. I wonder right now, just this moment of Joseph's story, which parts might you relate to? Maybe it's the physical pain. Maybe it's the emotional wound. Maybe it's the pain of being betrayed, hungry, alone, confused. Here's what Joseph would have seen as they finally make their way into this bustling metropolis in Egypt world superpower at the time in one of the mega cities of the ancient world. And Joseph would have seen as he's along in this slave chain gang on their way into the city, these huge hand-carved statues. And he finds himself with blood and blisters and calluses there in North Africa. They enter this metropolis and it's an open market. There's all sorts of animals for sale and fabrics for sale and oils and foods and animals for sale. And Joseph, in the middle of the noise of a thousand strangers, is put up for sale as property. He gets purchased by someone he doesn't know who speaks a language he doesn't know. Here's an ancient Egyptian drawing from around this era, and it shows you, if you look at it, Uh, the brutality of the way these slaves were traded. The tall figure on the right is Egyptian. On the left, you see three slaves, and you can actually see they have three different skin colors. Egypt, as a world superpower, was gathering slaves from north, south, east, west, there in North Africa. Here's the Egyptian social pyramid at this time in history. You can see the pharaoh is at the top, has totally unchecked power as a a tyrant, a dictator, a ruler, but also was worshipped as God. Every Egyptian had to kneel down and bow down and worship Pharaoh. Under Pharaoh, you see his government officials, and then you see his soldiers who keep order in the nation uh, through just brutal methods, and on it goes down to the slaves. As you can see, there's about 20 slaves for every one Egyptian And that's why the soldiers were so important to keep the slaves in order. And Joseph becomes at the very bottom of society, not just a slave, but a slave of a different ethnicity. And yet in that, we see in the book of Genesis that Joseph continues to trust God. The promise God gave him, it sure doesn't look like it's going to happen. But he chose to walk with God. He chose to still believe that God wasn't doing this to him. It was his brothers who did this. And that God wasn't the source of all the evil in Egypt. That was was Pharaoh and wicked people. And so Joseph, instead of turning away from God in his pain, he clings all the tighter to God. And so even though he's working out in the fields as a slave, Joseph walking with God is honest. He's trustworthy. He's one of the best workers. And he works his way up as he learns the language to actually be a slave in the house of his master, a guy named Potiphar. And that's pretty nice because now you get to eat, you get to sleep inside, like life's better when you're an inside slave for Joseph. And then Joseph keeps working his way up and he gets all the way up to where he becomes in charge of this entire estate, be like a plantation in our American context. He's in charge of it all. And so if you imagine Joseph's life as a graph, you know, it's up here and it goes way down and now he's worked his way up and he's trusting God And this is when, if you're familiar with the story, he gets falsely accused. Potiphar's wife was, I guess what you'd call today, a desperate housewife, an Egypt, desperate housewives of Egypt. 
And she tries to seduce Joseph while he's working in the house one day. And he resists her. He says, I couldn't do that to my master. And uh, then she lies about him. She's, she's petty and she's jealous and she's hurt. And she lies and says that he tried to seduce her. So Genesis 39 verse 20, Joseph's master took him and put him in prison. How would you feel if you'd lost everything and you'd worked as hard as you could to, to get a little something back and then someone lies about you, someone wrongs you, and now, boom, you've lost everything again. There are hints in here. I, 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 I'm trying to summarize the story, but Potiphar most likely knew that Joseph was innocent. There's a lot of prisons he could have put him in. You know, I've heard that if you commit a crime in the U.S., you want to be in federal, not in state. And it was kind of like that. Joseph goes to the best prison, so Potiphar probably knows that Joseph's actually innocent, but what's he going to do? But notice this. A lot of us in this moment would say, man, God gave me this promise, and things just keep getting worse. Joseph somehow continues to believe God has a plan. And in time, it will be revealed that it's no accident that Joseph is in Pharaoh's prison. Because guess who else is in Pharaoh's prison? A lot of his friends (laughs) Because Pharaoh has unchecked power, if he has a bad day, if he doesn't like the meal he's fed, he sends the baker to prison. If he doesn't like the joke one of his friends told, he sends them to prison. So a lot of Pharaoh's friends are in and out. And so now Joseph chooses to continue to believe God's promise, to trust God in the difficulty. And the same thing that happened as a slave, now as an inmate, all the other inmates and even the guards are like, boy, it's great having Joseph around. We can kind of trust Joseph. He's honest. We can give him jobs around here. And Joseph becomes really favored among all these inmates who happen to all be friends of Pharaoh. Verse uh, 21 of chapter 39. While Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. There's someone here today and this is the, the, the portion of God's word that God brought you here for. This is God's word for you. You're in a prison of pain. You're in a prison of addiction. You're in a prison of uncertainty. And your pain sensors and the whispers of the enemy are saying, God's not there. God doesn't care. And what God tells you today through the true story of Joseph is that God is with you in your prison. He's with you in your suffering. Don't turn away from him, turn to him. He was with Joseph in the suffering. Choose to believe that. Well, God's gonna use this in his providence because soon one of Pharaoh's friends who's been in prison, Pharaoh calls the guy back out, change of mood. And Joseph has helped this guy in some really big ways. And so you'd be thinking, oh good, the guy who got out is gonna tell Pharaoh how great Joseph is. Two years pass. Two years. Have you ever been in a situation where you're like, oh, oh, now I think I see how it could get better. And then a year passes. And then another year passes. Joseph keeps believing the promises of God. He keeps trusting that God has a plan. He keeps believing God's not the author of the evil in my life, but God has the power to work even the evil for good if I'll keep trusting him. And finally, two years later, Pharaoh has this problem he can't solve, and the friend of Joseph's from the other inmate from prison who's out says, oh, Pharaoh, wait, wait, I should have told you this two years ago, but there's a guy who I met in prison who could solve your problem. And Pharaoh's like, well, bring him here. So in a moment, Joseph goes from inmate to getting all cleaned up, shoved into the presence of this God small g, emperor, ruler, king, who could kill him at the snap of a finger? (laughs) Think about this. In Joseph's life, if he'd gone straight from the youngest brother in the fields to this moment, he wouldn't have known Pharaoh's language. He wouldn't have known Pharaoh's culture. He wouldn't have even known how to stand. He knows all that from his time as a slave, from his time as an inmate, While God wasn't causing the suffering, God actually used the suffering to prepare Joseph. And we see in Joseph's answer to Pharaoh here in verse 16, his high view of God. This is representative of how did Joseph 
get through, how did he smile through all these tears? How did he smile through all this pain? It's because he always saw God this way. Look at this. Pharaoh presents his problem to Joseph. Joseph knows I could get killed or at the very least sent back to prison if I don't solve his problem. And what are, what are the first words out of his mouth? I cannot do it. I cannot do it. But God will. There's someone here, or maybe in Avon, or maybe online, and here's the deal. You're going through your suffering, and you're trying to believe in God. You're trying to do the right stuff, but you have yet to come to the moment of humility where you acknowledge you can't beat that addiction in your strength. You can't figure out where your family fits in your strength. You can't beat the cancer. You can't heal the marriage. You, you can't, but God can. And Joseph, because he had this high view of God and this clinging to God's promises, stands before this emperor and says, um, what you're asking me to do, I'm incapable. But I have a God who can. I have a God who can. And as Joseph turns to God for the answer to Pharaoh's question, God provides it. Pharaoh brings Joseph into his inner circle. Joseph is one of his counselors, advisors. And then Joseph runs the exact same play that he ran in Potiphar's house. From slave out into the fields to trusted right-hand counselor. And Joseph becomes the right-hand person. And Pharaoh says, literally all of my kingdom, Joseph, you're in charge of it. You're pretty much like the junior Pharaoh. You snap your fingers, whatever you want done will be done. And I'm summarizing about, summarizing about 20 chapters of the Bible here, so bear with me. But eventually, this famine, uh, there's a famine, and God used Joseph to help Pharaoh prepare. They've stockpiled food. All the surrounding nations are starving to death, and they're coming to Egypt. Pharaoh's selling the extra food. And who comes in? with all these other dehydrated, malnourished foreigners begging for food, but Joseph's brothers. And Joseph hears about these people who speak Hebrew, and then they're standing before him. They don't know it's their brother that they threw in a pit and sold as a slave, because now he looks like the emperor of Egypt. And here's what he says in Genesis 50, verse 20, when he's reunited with his brothers. He says, you intended to harm me. That was your motive. You wanted to kill me. You wanted to hurt me. But God, God is so big. God is so powerful. God is so all wise that he can take a person's evil intentions and he can spin them in the pinball game of the universe that he's in charge of. He spun your evil intentions and he worked it out for good. Notice, Joseph never says, hey guys, it's okay what you did to me. But he says, my God is so big that even when you abused me and you wronged me and you betrayed me, my God had the ability to turn it for good. He brought me into this position so that I could save the lives of many people. And this is, whenever you go through suffering in this fallen world, what God will do in the end for you and through you if you'll continue to believe his promises and trust his plan in your suffering. This doesn't make it hurt less. There are still tears. There's still pain. But this allows you to smile through the tears. It allows you to smile through the pain because you just know like a a, a Super Bowl athlete whose muscles are burning and they've never been so fatigued and they know I've just got to keep giving it everything I've got because there's a trophy that awaits. There's a good ending to this suffering. You can know that, child of God. Your suffering, not only will it end, God will use it to help other people and to save the lives of others. So that's our big idea. Hopefully it makes more sense now. Keep believing God's promises in the middle of what you're going through right now. 
where you are right now, connect these dots in your heart, in your will, in your spirit. Identify your pain. Choose to believe God's bigger. Choose to believe he'll bring good from it. And just claim this right now. God, let me be like Joseph. God, help me to believe you in my suffering. And of course, Jesus, who Joseph is kind of a a foreshadowing picture of what Jesus would be like, a suffering servant sold for the price of a slave who gives his life, right? Uh, One of Jesus' 12 betrays him. Joseph was one of 12. There's a thousand parallels. And what does Jesus do the night before the cross? He agonizes in the garden of Gethsemane. He's sweating drops of blood. He says to the disciples, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And yet in it, he says, Father, not my will, but yours be done. As almighty God humbled down to earth in a human form, he modeled for us, trust the plans of God the Father. Trust that if he allows you to go through pain, there's good on the other side of it. He doesn't delight in your suffering. He's near to the brokenhearted. He will uphold you in your suffering. He's not only going to deliver you and get you through, but he's going to work good from it. Unthinkable pain leads to unimaginable good. In Joseph's case, where his family would have starved to death, they flourish. He ends up moving them all to Egypt with him. He's reunited with his dad. It's a picture of the moment when you and I will step into the kingdom of God. We're reunited with our loved ones who've gone before, and we've gone through the pain. This world is our Egypt, if you will. So what would this look like in your life today? I want to give you three really practical steps. They're not long. They're pretty simple. Three steps that you could take today. Step one is this. Turn to God in your pain rather than turning away from God because of your pain. Turn to God in your pain. I would suggest that this is the most important decision that you make in your suffering. Spiritually, when you're in pain, when you're going through difficulty, there's really just two choices. It might seem like there's thousands of choices, but there's two. Because of your pain, you're either going to turn away from God, which would reveal that in your deepest heart you believe God's not for you, God's somehow against you, or you're going to choose, God, I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense, but I choose to turn to you. I just wonder right now, Which choice have you been making lately? Which of those two? And right now, which one will you choose today? Will you choose to say, God, I might not understand it, but I'm going to turn to you in my pain. Whether your pain drives you toward God or away from God does not depend on your pain. It depends on your will. Depends on you. Uh, this is important. This is kind of challenging thinking, but put on your thinking cap with me here because a lot of us in our pain, we settle for this false assumption that, well, I just turned away from God because of my pain. But here's what I've seen. I saw this as a journalist when I was a news reporter and I saw people of faith who helped bring me back to faith as well as as a pastor. I've seen this. I've seen people go through pretty low level pain on the scale of what people go through. Pretty low level And I've seen them get bitter at God and turn away from God in a pain that, well, pretty much everyone goes through that, breakup or something. I've seen other people go through extreme, excruciating pain. A friend of mine named named Joy, who um, was run over by a car as an adult, and it broke her back, and she's in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. And in her pain, she turned to God. And it has transformed her. And what I've learned is whether a person, whether you, turn to God or away from God is not, is not dependent on the level of pain. It's dependent on your will. And I would just encourage you, choose. <laughs> By the way, none of us are perfect at this, right? I've, I've had plenty of moments where I turned away from God because of my pain. It's never too late. As long as you're still breathing here on earth, turn back to him. And then choose to say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to go to you as one who can help me with my pain rather than running from you because I think you're causing my pain. Step two, believe that God will work unthinkable good from your unthinkable pain. This is why it's called faith, because you can't see it. It doesn't make a lot of sense. 
And faith is choosing to believe it. I'll take you into the moment where Joseph smiles through his tears in Genesis 45. This is the first time he was reunited with his brothers. He's, he's sitting there in his royal getup. His brothers are emaciated. They're malnourished. And he sees that it's them, but they don't yet know that this ruler up on the throne with all these attendants and soldiers is Joseph. They don't know that yet, but Joseph sees it. And so he says to all the Egyptian attendants, have everyone leave my presence. He wants to be alone with his brothers. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known. Look at verse two. And he wept so loudly that even though he had had all the Egyptians leave the royal room, they could hear him. They hear, they hear him sobbing. And it is this moment where the years of suffering, the years of loneliness, the years of injustice, the years of being whipped, of being imprisoned, all of it in this moment, he sees this is what God was doing. Even though other people were tossing in ingredients into my life of evil and trying to hurt me, God was this master chef who's mixing it all for good. And in this moment, he's just overcome with this mixture of emotions, pain, sorrow, joy, wonder, this moment. He's smiling through his tears, and Joseph says to his brothers, verse 4, come close to me. As they gather near, I would imagine he takes off maybe some of the Egyptian jewelry they wore a ton in that culture, and they see his eyes, and he says, I'm, I'm Joseph. I'm the one you sold as a slave years ago. Of course, his brothers assume, we're dead. <laughs> Logical assumption. So he says, verse five, now don't be distressed. Don't be angry with yourselves. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Don't be distressed where you've messed up in life. God can work, God can bring good from it. Don't be distressed. Maybe God has sent someone you love and you want them here with you on earth. He's sent them ahead of you to the kingdom of God. If he sent them ahead first, he's got a reason. Maybe someone comes to know Christ as their savior as a result. Maybe people will be fed as a result. God is a God who works good out of evil. When you hear the old Christian word redeemer, that's what that means. A redeemer is one who takes something that was meant for evil and they turn it for good. And God is the only one capable of redeeming pure evil, and yet he can. Joseph says, for two years now, there's been a famine in the land. And because of the dream God gave Pharaoh and the interpretation God gave me, I know this famine's gonna last another five years, seven years where people don't have food. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant and to save your lives. Think about this. God loved those brothers who sold Joseph as a slave. And God loved Joseph. And God had a purpose. Joseph looks back and with tears coming down his cheeks and heaving from emotion, he's essentially saying, God had a purpose for my pain. I kept believing it didn't make sense and now I see why. I see that we're going to be reunited and our kids will play together and there's going to be food for us to eat. The more painful it is now, the more beautiful it will be when you see God miraculously turn your pain for good. This one's a little bit deeper today, but these are things that, that all come out of Joseph's story. The deeper your pain is now, the more awe-inspiring and overwhelming your future moment will be, child of God, when you see that though God was not the author of the evil, as you trusted him and believed him and clung to him, he was indeed working all things together for your good. Final step today, hand over the core issue of your suffering to God. We saw Joseph model this when he said to Pharaoh, I can't do it. Now, I'm not saying to not try if you're battling addiction or um, in your marriage or whatever your pain is. You should do what you can do. 
but do it in a way that says, God, I, I need your help. I'm going to hand over, you know, most of us have things in our motives and in our emotions that we don't even understand. Maybe they go back to our childhood or other things where we don't even realize, oh, that's why I'm so desperate for approval or that's why I'm so desperate to find where I belong. Handing it over to God is saying, God, here's the thing that pains me and grieves me. And I think that if this changed, I would be all better. But I'm going to hand it over to you because maybe it's something way deeper that you need to work on that I don't even see or understand about myself. And I'm going to trust that you're bigger. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this thing to you. Giving it to God doesn't mean that it doesn't still hurt. But, but it's this, I can't, but God can in Major League Baseball, an average pitch now is between 90 and 100 miles per hour. That's fast enough that if it hits you in the head, it can kill you. It happened about 100 years ago to a Major League Baseball player. That whole industry, $7 billion a year generated, comes down to a few inches on the bat. And here's a picture of it. It's called the sweet spot. If a batter can hit that 95 mile an hour pitch, not just with any part of the bat, but with the sweet spot, it's pretty much a guaranteed home run, or if there's guys on the bases, grand slam. It's guaranteed. The problem is most humans don't have the capacity to do that. And even the very best fail at least half the time. What God's teaching us today is that the trials of your life are like the evils that are thrown at you by Satan, by your unjust brothers, by your slave masters. They're, they're evils that are thrown at you, and, and, and as if I were a batter, <laughs> I'd have no chance of hitting a 95-mile-an-hour pitch. I mean, like, why even try? And there will be some evil, there will be some pain that flies into your life so fast that if you're honest, you, you don't have any chance of turning it for good. And what God says is, is, hand me the bat. God bats a thousand. He hits every one of the curveballs, every one of the difficulties that, that fly at you in life. Only God has the capacity to, uh, you know, the intersection of the difficulties thrown at you. And how you connect with them is this sweet spot. And in the right hands, a deadly fastball becomes a home run. Genesis 50 verse 18, his brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. So he sends them back and he asks them to bring his dad home and the other brother who they hadn't brought with them. They now return, they've processed it for this long journey they're like, we still can't believe Joseph is letting us live. He probably just used us to get dad back because he misses dad. They throw themselves down and they say, we are your slaves. How's that for poetic justice? And Joseph says to them, look again at Joseph's high view of God. Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Well, ironically, there's about 2 million Egyptians who would say, yes, you are. You are the God. You, you tell us what to do. You're the divinity. But Joseph has never stopped believing, no matter what anyone around him says, there's one true God, and I'm his servant, and he'll keep his promises to me, and he has a plan that will work out for good. And so when his brothers throw themselves down and they say, please don't kill us, please just let us be your slaves, he says, am I God? <laughs> Am I in the place to judge your life? It reveals a mindset that Joseph had in the pit and in the prison and in Potiphar's house that God is bigger, that God is smarter, that I will trust him. And right back to our core verse, this is a paraphrase of it. it says, you planned evil against me, but God used those same plans that you meant for evil. God used them for my good. Had to go through pain, but he brought good from it. And as you see all around you now, you see this flourishing empire that has food and water when no one else does. God worked all of this to bring life to many people. God had a purpose. 
I hope you know, believer, the moment will come when you see Jesus face to face. And these words will be spoken by Jesus to the serpent of Eden, Satan, the enemy of our souls, who brought death into our families, who brought pain into our bodies, that everything he meant for evil, all the scheming he did to kill and steal and destroy, when Jesus died on the cross and rose again, he hit a home run. He took all that evil and he repurposed it right back out in the other direction for good. And all of us who trust in Jesus are essentially now we're attached to his movement of bringing good from evil. So don't stop believing in your pain that he can and will bring good from it. What Joseph could not do on his own, bring good out of his pain, God did. Why? Because Joseph handed it to God. What does all this mean for you? In God's hands, your pain, my pain, our pain, can and will be repurposed for unimaginable good. Let me pray this for you now. Father, you're near to the brokenhearted. You uphold those who are crushed in spirit. God, right now you see every person who's hurting here and in Avon and online. God, will you help us to turn to you in our pain? We help our unbelief. We, we struggle, Lord, to, to really believe that how could you possibly bring good out of this? Lord, if you did it for Joseph, you can do it for us. And Jesus, at the cross, you proved that you've defeated, you've defeated the villain of our stories, Satan. Lord, we give you our pain. We turn to you in our pain. Help us to trust you and persevere like Joseph did for years in our pit in our prison, when we feel enslaved. May we continue to trust you and cling to you and walk with you. And Lord, always have this bigger view. I can't, but God can. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, can we thank Pastor John for that word? John, thank you. Hey, let's choose. Let's choose this week to keep believing the promises of God. We're so excited about our Thursday night service. It kicks off this week. This week, service starts at 6.30, but we'll have an affordable family meal for you and your family starting at 5 o'clock. Come join us. Let's enjoy a meal together. And this Thursday night, we're so excited about the early weekend service. We'd love for you to come and join us. And if you're new to Connection Point, you want to know how you can be a part of this place, what God is doing, and where you fit into the story, we'd love for you to join us at Connection Lunch. It's next Sunday after our 11 a.m. service. You head to cp.news right now. You can get signed up for Connection Lunch. It's a great way. It's a great way. If you're new, you're looking to fit in and find a place where God can use the unique gifts that he's given you, come join us at Connection Lunch. If you have any questions, stop by the next, next steps wall on your way out. We'll see you here next week. Have a great week, guys.